good. So welcome, 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 welcome. Today, unexpected, we are going to go through, and I'm going to try to make this not a thing that happens a lot because clearly, um, I think we're all, <laughs> we're all, we're all tired of, uh, reviewing Stephen Furtick sermons, but the reason I wanted to do this was because there, there's something new that he's doing. And I'm assuming he's only doing this because of his, um, his upcoming, like his book that just came out. And that seems to be why he's kind of doing this, where he'll bring a screen on stage during his sermons and he'll like use the markup tool to go through and kind of mark up, um, you know, what, what he's doing as far as, um, you know, go through the scripture, underline things, do things like that. And that seems to be kind of his go-to thing right now while he's working through the different chapters of his book. So um, there was a sermon that was going around online that people were commenting about. I didn't want to do that one, um, mainly because I, I thought I was originally going to do that one. I was going to do that one because I thought that was the only sermon that he did this whole go through and mark up the board on. It's not though. Apparently he's doing this for all of the chapters that he's doing in his book. So today what I want to look at is a sermon from 11 days ago called God chose you dot, 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 will you now that the title in of itself sounds very self-help, but the only reason I want to cover a Stephen Furtick sermon again is to kind of go through and review how he's teaching his people to read the scriptures. I've said this before in a lot of different sermon reviews that as a pastor, how you walk through the scripture and how you are reading the scripture teaches them how they should read the scripture as well. And I've seen this not only in the people I go to church with or the people I grew up with or the way I used to read scripture is that you're getting trained that way. And then when you're getting trained to read scripture in an incorrect way, you just defaultly start to read it that way as well. So this sermon's an hour long. Obviously, if you have watched these sermon reviews before, you know that this is going to be much more than an hour long. Afterwards, uh, you'll be able to find in the description the original link to this sermon that we're going to review. You'll be able to find a link to the free sermon review guide as well. And we're going to do that with this sermon, what we do with every sermon that we review, which is ask three things, right? We're going to look and say, does he read the scripture? Does he exegete the scripture? And does he preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those are all three things that we're still going to be looking at in this sermon. Specifically though, and this is like a unique thing that he's now doing, we're going to kind of look how he breaks down the scripture literally in front of people and how he's teaching them to read it. So let's go over to the review screen and get this going. Hopefully, I'm kind of on a time time schedule, um, so I don't know if we're actually going to get all the way through this sermon. I hope we are. It's an hour long. Even if this takes two hours to do, I know most of you will not be able to stick all this out for two hours, but you can come back and rewatch it later if you'd like. We're going to see if we can get done by about 3.15 Eastern Standard Time. We'll see if that works. So let's go ahead and get into this sermon and see kind of where we're going to be. I've never watched this before. It's full disclosure. I have no clue what he's going to talk about minus the title. Um, So let's get into it and see kind of how he breaks down scripture uh, for his people. Blessings upon you today. Grace and mercy to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. May the God of all comfort comfort you today. May the God of all peace guard your heart and your mind. I'm glad you're here. If you're watching online, I'm glad you chose to watch this video. God knows there's a lot of other stuff you could have watched on the internet. Here you are listening to a Holy Ghost preacher today. God might just speak to you. This word might just make you jump. Your phone might heat up with this word today. The presence of the Lord is in this place. I'll give him one thing. He definitely sets expectations, right? I mean, the expectation is set. You're going to hear from God. You're going to get excited. You're going to like, these are the expectations that he's setting from the pulpit. And I think a lot of reasons people like him is for that reason. It's hard to not like somebody that's trying to get you pumped up and that sort of thing. So I think that's that's the likability of Stephen Furtick is really that pump you up, get you going, get you excited, juxtaposed to a lot of pastors that you hear that are boring and not necessarily that into, they don't seem like they're that into uh, preaching the word. And he does not come off that way. He definitely comes off as excited. I got five people that agree with me at Valentine. How about University City? 
Let me know about the volume too. If this is too loud, I can turn it down a little bit. How about y'all up here in the top section? Do you believe that God can do something amazing today? Glory to God. I'm fired up. I got the Holy Ghost. I'm burning up. Tell your neighbor, if you brought cold water, don't pour your water on me. Tell them, I got the Holy Ghost, and I'm burning up. Anybody burning up today? Yeah. Yeah. I don't need a sauna to burn up. I got the Spirit of the Lord. I feel it heating up right now. This is an amazing day in your life, and I need you to know that if you need to get a record of who you were before this series, you need to take a selfie right now because you will be unrecognizable seven weeks from now what God is about to do in your life. Oh, I do want to mention, I know this doesn't have anything to do with the text that he's looking at, but just this, this sort of preaching is that there is this, especially with every series, and I don't know if you've been in churches like this, but with every new series, there's this like this expectation. So there's this rotation of excitement. So you start a new series and like, hey, by the end of this series, you're going to be different. And then you start another series. Hey, you're not going to miss want to miss this series because you're going to be different at the end of this one. And so it's this constant. I mean, it works in the content rich environment that we live in, right? This expectation, like you've got to keep producing that energy, that momentum. Um, and so he does that in sermon form, not so much like content form like you see on the internet, but it's this consistent, you know that there's always going to be a new sermon. There's always going to be new excitement. There's always going to be expectation. And so there's just like this constant sort of um, maybe th this felt need of that and also this excitement that's always behind it. Now, again, we could kind of dive into all that, but that that is the rotation, the carousel of what's happening. No, I declare it. I decree it and I choose to believe it. Today I'm releasing to my church my first new book in eight years, Do the New You. And you get it first. That's right. This is written so I can come home with you. Sound kind of weird. This is where I get to coach you. This is where I get to be a voice in your life that reminds you that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, the voice in your life that helps you realize that you are more than the math of what is against you, that you are more than the mistakes that you have made, that the great I Am lives in you, and whatever he is, you are too. Woo! I feel a flow coming. Give me an acoustic guitar ready for when I finish preaching. I feel fresh oil. I feel fresh songs. I feel a fresh word coming to your house today. I'm excited. And we've been going absolutely crazy. I'm going to read you the scripture in a moment, so stay standing if you are standing and stand up if you're not, because I want you ready. We've been really overdoing it. I think I told Holly, we've got so much content coming your way. Next week, you'll get to hear about our e-group study your very own Holly Furtick has created for you with our team. Let's thank God for her. Yeah. To walk you through each week. In case you're wondering, we are going to get to the sermon. If you're new to Stephen Furtick's sermons, there's always like usually this sort of announcement time beforehand, and this is basically where we're at before we get into the scripture. What we're doing, take it further so you can get the book, you can get the audio book. The audio book is... That's, that's, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. And uh, then I've also put together a master class for you with a friend of mine who is a personal development and also performance coach, and we get into it from the biblical side. But then how many know if you have the truth, but you don't have the tools to put the truth into practice? Sometimes it's like a seed that doesn't take root and bear fruit in your life, so that's going to be available. I sat down with my oldest son Elijah and JT and recorded for the Youth Nation podcast, a special conversation that's been 18 years in the making ever since Elijah was born, and that will be dropping later this week, and the book is available. But today, I want to put this thing in 3D for you, and I want to go to the Scripture that started it all. 
for Jeremiah and for me as this concept do the new you comes to life. Oh, I'm excited. Jeremiah chapter 1. Okay, what we always say is um, in any of these sermon reviews, as soon as they mention the scripture they're going to go to, you're going to want to go there as well. The assumption, obviously, is that they're going to have it up on their screen too. Um, in fact, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, the he's going to probably, I, I know he is because I saw the uh, like a, a short of his, but he's going to roll out a screen and then he'll kind of work through the message as well. And that's what, if if you forget what I said at the beginning of this video, that's what we're really interested in is watching his thought process as he breaks down the scripture that he's using for his main point here that not only is this message based off of but also that this book right so he he's apparently working through a series that's based on his book and he's using um, biblical text for each chapter to break that down now, there was one that went viral. I don't know if it's the one before this or after this. I don't know where it's at in the series. There is one that went viral where he was going over about the title of the two blind men, and he was making a huge deal about that. This isn't that sermon. This is a different one, um, but I am interested to see kind of what he does does here. Jeremiah chapter 1 is where he's going to be. We'll kind of see kind of what he's going to do with that. Um, so let's get back into it and dig in. Jeremiah chapter 1. I got some surprises for you over the next seven weeks, and uh, this will be a foundation today for us to build on. One more page. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Let's go. The word of the Lord came to me, saying… I'm not going to do it, y'all, but I could preach the entire message off of that verse. I'm not going to do it. I got more verses, but I could stop right there and preach. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, first of all, the word is perpetual. It came to me. It doesn't just come once when God said, let there be light. There can still be light because he's still speaking. Not only. Okay. <laughs> I'll just, I'll stop in there for a second because again, what I try to say a lot is that whenever we're reading the scripture, I actually posted about this today. Whenever we're reading scripture, we have to be aware of the context that that particular scripture is in. That doesn't make it any less alive, any less powerful, any less anything. It's still the word of God, but it helps us to understand what is being said when we understand where it's being said from, right? So if we know this is Jeremiah, we know, first of all, and we'll go back and do this here in a minute, but we know that it's from the book of Jeremiah. We know there's a lot in Jeremiah that's prophecy. There's a lot of Jeremiah that's calling out to the people that are either, depending on where you're at in Jeremiah, either going to be taken into exile or to the people in exile. And we're going to, the, the entire book is about God calling his people to be faithful and the consequences of not being that and what that means for them. And there's just, there's a whole lot in Jeremiah. Now he started in chapter one, which is going to be helpful for us, at least when we're looking at the scripture, because now we're in chapter one in the very first thing, we don't even have to worry about, um, like how, how much beforehand happened. We're going to be able to read it right as it occurs. So anyway, he's going off of now the word came to the Lord and he's going on this big thing about the word of the Lord. It comes all the time. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. And he is using that in a way that says, well, the word of the Lord can come to him today or the word of the Lord can come to you today. But the way he's going to be using it, if you know how he speaks, is much more in a, I mean, there, there are sermons that if you watch Verdict, He'll stop halfway through and say, thanks, Lord, for that word, as if God audibly dropped something in his head. Um, and that's what he's talking about, uh, an active, maybe not audible, but definitely close to it, word from God. Um, not checked against scripture, but just there. So anyway, let, let's keep going. Is it perpetual, but it is personal. The word of the Lord came to me. Somebody say, speak to me, Lord. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you need it. I hope he does speak to you. It's perpetual, it's personal, but watch this. It is also predestined. And this is where we want to get today, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, 
I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. All that sounds good, sovereign Lord, I said. I don't know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord… This sounds like an interruption of your insecurities. Would you let God interrupt your secure in your insecurities if he wants? So we're already th this is something I just want to point out just so we're all very clear. In fact, let's let's just go over let's just go over to the Bible screen right now because I, we're not going to get very far in this at all without having to to address this. All right, so here's the here's the thing. When we understand the text within its context, we're able to understand what is being said, which is going to eliminate everything that he's trying. I mean, yes, the word of the Lord is personal. Yes, it has application. Yes, it is alive and able to change lives. That is altogether different than reading yourself into it as he's just done. Like, so if we go all the way to chapter one, it says the word of the, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hakikat, and I'm going to say that wrong, one of the priests who were in uh, Anatok, the land of Benjamin, and whom the word of the Lord came in the day of Joshua, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign, right? So all of that, I mean, let, let's just, this is an important thing to know when you're reading the Bible, okay? This right here, incredibly important. It literally sets the tone for what we're supposed to understand for the rest of the book, that, okay, this is who it is. This is who the, they're the son of. This is who's in charge at that point. This is who's king. Not only is this who's king, this is the 13th year of that king's reign. So all of these things are set up for us. We can keep going. Verse 3, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Joshua, king of Judah, and until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Joshua, the king of Judah, until the captives of Jerusalem in the fifth month, right? All of this is incredibly important to understand as you enter in to the book of Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah is setting up, hey, this is the time, this is the place, this is what's going on, so that we can place it and understand what the context of the situation is, like what's happening right now. Now, within the context of one through three, within this timeline, right? This is this is bringing us into like a very, this is historical, right? Content, this lets us know where we're at. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to me. Now this me specifically here is talking about Jeremiah. The, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me. Now, as the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. There's some, in other important verses, the ones that, that uh, Freddie actually pointed out here that are kind of, I guess, the main point of what he's going to be doing during this sermon. And that is right here. God telling him that he's the one that formed him. He's the one that set him apart. He's the one that appointed him as prophet of the nations. And this is important, right? This is important. It's him that appointed him as prophet to the nations and this part is very important because this is what Jeremiah is going to do through the rest of the book. And so in chapter one of Jeremiah, we've already set up, this is the time, this is the place, this is who is in charge, this is what's going on. These are the people that we can kind of chronicle through this entire book of who is doing what and when. <clears throat> and Jeremiah is called and appointed as a prophet of God to the nations. Now, we also understand here, I accidentally... Accidentally marked this uh, this part up a little bit. Oh, oops, sorry. Hold on. Well, this is great. My thing, my my thing now froze. So we're gonna go back. I'm gonna have to restart it. The point is, what we see is God coming to Jeremiah, telling him, "I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This is what I'm gonna have you do. These are, you know, and and Jeremiah not being so secure about it, right? So that is the truth of the text. Jeremiah is not very secure about himself because he says I'm just a youth. So not only not only do we have the time and place that things are happening, we also get I'm sorry, this technical difficulties guys. We're also getting that Jeremiah is really young when this happens. So we have a timeline also for Jeremiah. Now not only do we have a timeline for Jeremiah, okay, here we go. We're back. We're back. Let me see if I can 
get back over here to this eraser. There we go. Good, 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 good. All right, so we also know that Jeremiah is not incredibly happy about the situation. He's but a youth. And this is what it says in verse six. Then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth for all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whoever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. All right. So what we have here is a conversation between God and Jeremiah about God's mission for him, Jeremiah's insecurity in his youth to do that, but God telling him that he will be able to do it because God is going with him. This isn't about us. This isn't about you or me. This isn't about anything like that. This is a very specific account, a narrative of the conversation between God and Jeremiah. And the reason that's important is that that sets us up for the rest of the narrative in the book that we're going to see Jeremiah and what he says and how he says it and how people react to him is all foundationally set up for us in this first chapter. There's obviously more. I don't know how far Ferdict will get into it, but those are the verses he's talked about so far. Let's, let's keep going. Wanted to today, but the Lord, somebody say, but the Lord said to me, do not say, I am too young. Y'all, whatever you put behind the words I am is a direct reflection on your maker because that's his name. That's, that's exactly a Joel Olstein sort of quote. Joel Olstein has an entire sermon about I am and then I am whatever God. Yeah, it's a whole Joel Olstein thing. So the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And let's camp on verse 9 today. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. The title of our first message for our brand new series, Do the New You, is God Chose You. Will you? Okay. All right. I think I know where this is going already. We're pretty, we're pretty soon in it. Or yeah. So he gets, Behold, I have put the words in your mouth. Oh man, I messed it up. He does the whole, I put the words in your mouth. And he's going to use that probably, if I had to guess, he's going to use that um, as a, the Lord has put the words in your mouth and therefore goal uh, because the Lord has done that. Now, he'll probably ignore, see that I have set, uh, set you this day before the nations over kingdoms and plucked you up uh, to break down and destroy and overthrow and build up into plant. We're not going to talk about that <laughs> because that won't fit with you. Um, but my guess is he's going to use verse nine specifically. The Lord has put the words in your mouth and he has chosen you. But I'm going to let him talk for a while now, just so you know, because again, we have a limited amount of time and I want to make sure we get to the point where he's marking up the board so we can see how he does that and really look at that. So let's, let's hop back into that. Put that in the comments right now. God chose you. Now a question, will you? That's what we're going to decide. And spirit of God, I declare over each and every life who connected with this message that you have already decided and destined who they will become. Now, God, I come into partnership with you to speak your words over your people, and I expect a great success from it because you're with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. You feel like we could go home on that? But we won't. It's good to go over this material. I've spent a year writing this book, Do the New You. Do the new you .com. That's do the new you.com. Yeah, I'm promoting it because I believe in it. And um, I believe in it because I need it. And from what I see as a pastor, you do too. You do too. 
seeing all the people that we get to meet and all of the precious people that we get to partner with in ministry who are silently asking the same question but maybe afraid to say it because it makes them sound like rookies or complainers. And the question is, how do I change? How do I make changes that stay? How do I change? Jesus. That's, that's the answer, Jesus. And the first step to this, I would contend, does not start with you at all. It starts with the God who changes you. And the God that changes you is the God that created you. Start taking notes at any time. None of this is in the book. I'm flowing in the Holy Ghost right now. It reminded me, go ahead and bring that screen out. I got a bunch of toys coming today because I think I want this message to be special, so I got all the stuff that I'm planning to bring up here on the stage. But bring that screen out. Um, now, I'm not the most technological person, and um, I'm going to bring up my scriptures, some of my scriptures on the screen, and draw on the screen for just for visual learners. How many of you are visual learners? Uh huh. And how many of you are, uh, what's the other one? Auditory learners. And how many of you are um, still trying to figure out what style you are because you're 50 and you still haven't learned everything <laughs> that you think you need to know? Good. Anyway, it just reminded me from um, when they were bringing this out. When the iPad first came out, before you were born, when the iPad was, was just a, an arrow in the quiver of Steve Jobs, um, I remember how excited I was to have my first iPad. I was flying somewhere to preach, and I had the iPad out because I wanted to preach from my iPad for the first time, and I was excited. And this guy next to me on the plane, I'm not judging him, but he looked kind of nerdy. He looked like a guy who knew a lot about technology. Is that a better way to say it? He looked very techy. He looked like a nerd. And he looked at my iPad and he started to lust. And he was like, How do you like it? Because at that time it was relatively new technology. And uh, I said, I love it. I just got it. It's great. And he goes, What do you do on it? I said, well, like I said, I just got it, but I mean, so far, uh, I'm a preacher, so I'm putting my Bible notes on here for my sermon and uh, play Angry Birds on it with my five year old, Fruit Ninja. So all of a sudden, his facial expression changed. I watched it. He went from excited to disgusted. Shook his head. And he looks back at me. I'll never forget what he said. This has been over a decade ago, and I remember exactly what he said. You are using that device far beneath its full potential. And he didn't want to talk the rest of the flight. It was absolute anathema to him, just the, the, the curse of Lucifer himself, to be sitting next to somebody on a plane who had something so powerful, who had something with so much potential. He's going to turn this into a sermon illustration. And here I am putting a slingshot at some birds and a sword on some watermelons. And he looked at it and said, oh, I wish I could get my hands on that iPad. You got more money than you do good sense if that's all you're doing with that iPad. Do you know what I could do with that iPad? I could, I could cure cancer with that iPad. And I guess he could. We didn't speak the rest of the time. I should have asked him. I should have asked him. Well, what will it do? I should have asked him, but I felt kind of embarrassed at that point to be sitting with something that was so amazing, and I knew it was amazing, but to be so limited in my ability to access the potential of something that was so powerful and to not know how. I should have asked him. He said, you are using… He lectured me. The, the class I didn't ask for. You are using that device. I wonder if God ever looks at what he made. Oh, yeah. I knew he was going to use it for an illustration. I was hoping he was going to use it as you are using the scripture in a way that is far beneath its potential, as in like if you dig into scripture and you know what it says and you know how to read it and you know what the original author says and how to apply it to your life, you will, the scriptures will come alive. But you're using it below its potential. You're just reading it and going on with life. But if you know how to read it, man, that brings it alive. I thought that was the direction he was going with it. That was going to be a really cool direction. He's going with the you are you know far below the potential that God has for you, which may also be true. Um, I think the spiritual, the scriptural 
analogy is a little bit more powerful, but y'all can help me preach anytime. Don't go Episcopalian on me my first Sunday of my new book series. I wonder if God ever looks at what is in your spirit. If God ever looks at the gifts that are in seed form in the soil of you. I wonder if God ever looks at the hand you've been dealt and the skillful hands you've been given and the opportunities and the open doors and the amazing ways that he has made for you and the amazing personality that he has endowed you on that you apologize for because it wasn't just like your brothers growing up. I wonder if God ever looks at what he gave you and says, you are using what you're holding far beneath its full. Potential. Now, of course, the phrase you do you is a controversial phrase. And that's obviously, I don't want to assume that you know what I'm trying to say here. It's when people, usually they're trying to say, I would never in my lifetime wear those, but you do you. <laughs> like, I think you look ridiculous. They don't say that part. They go, hey, you do you. Or, or in a more positive sense, it's what I told Holly when she was first trying to figure out how to preach. She was like, but I'm not preachy. I'm like, you don't need to scream. We got microphones. I just scream because I got issues. Be calm. Do you. People will actually be thankful that they don't have to listen to me scream that week when you get up and sound very softly, and you can kick their butts in a whisper. To try to use some of this, we just so I can break in a little bit here, is that he's technically right uh, in the sense that at the quality of the sermon is not determined by the loudness of the pastor. It is the, it's really determined by the depth of the scripture in which you 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 preach, right? I mean, a great sermon preached by anybody, as long as it's preached correctly as the text intended. It can be a great sermon. And this is why you can have pastors that are not loud or very extroverted or very um, dynamic in their speaking, preach incredibly powerful sermons because it's not about their personality. It's about God using them uh, to preach his word. That's also why you can have somebody that is really dynamic. And if they preach the word, it's it's the same as as if it's somebody that is not super dynamic because why the pa it doesn't rely on the pastor that's when if you start making preaching about personality and not about the scriptures then you get in issues this is why this is why whenever you uh, have a a, a a church built on the personality of a pastor when that pastor dies that church will either die with him or will in experience a very huge decrease in attendance because it was about that pastor's ability to speak. This is why, in my and this is just my opinion. I'll intervert this real quick and then we'll get back to it. This is why churches that are built uh, on an elders preaching, like a multiple elders preaching, are actually the better route to go because at that point it's not. It's not about the pastor's personality. It's about are we in the word, not necessarily about that pastor's personality. Or if it is just one single pastor, a pastor that does this well will make sure it's not about his personality. It's making sure it is about the word. Um, this is why I'm concerned about a lot of different churches, because <laughs> as soon as a pastor, this really well-known pastor dies, then what, what are you left with? Because now somebody else, as long as that church has been built on scriptural preaching, it shouldn't matter who gets up there as long as it's scriptural preaching. But if it's built on personality, it will matter. Do you? Do you? Look at somebody say, do you? And it's good, and I know it's a little bit old. It's a little cliche. Do you? And the only problem I have with the advice, do you, is that would be good advice if you knew you, but do you? <laughs> I'm going to have fun all by myself this week. Come on, I turn 44 next Monday. I'm too old to not enjoy this. Yeah, do you. And you know, I think that's a wonderful piece of advice if you're talking to somebody who's going to do a new hairstyle, right? If you ever watch an anniversary sermon from the church, you will notice 
the number of hair expressions that I have gone through in the years, and I apologize for none of them. Every single one of them I did. Every, every hairdo that I did at the time. This is true. If you want to watch the uh, making of a minister I did a verdict, his hairstyle changes a lot. Was good. And then a woman got online the other week and said, um, I'm very disappointed that you're dying your beard. I thought you were going to grow gray gracefully and show that the age of the Lord is a blessing. And I'm very disappointed to see that you begin to color your beard. So now you can't even dye you and do you without somebody telling you. Come on. I'm a diet for a little while. The Bible says, die to the old. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Do you? And if it goes gray, you'll know I'm ready to try new me. Very helpful advice if you're saying, hey, don't feel the pressure to perform like you saw somebody else perform. Do you? Sing in your range. Use your gift. Say it how you say it. That's great. Or, you know, get, get, get a mohawk. Everybody should do it once in their life. I just want to make a note that we're 17 minutes into the sermon and we haven't got to actually the scripture yet. Get a mullet. I'm halfway there right now. I'm thinking about it. And if that's what I want to do, I should do it. But listen, I didn't really come here to talk to you about mohawks and mullets, did I? I came to talk about mindsets. I came to talk about your mindset. What I am concerned about for the people that I pastor, and this doesn't have to be every pastor's burden, but I am concerned that the way we read Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 9 is different than how it happened. And I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to read it as if it were written with our just do you mentality that we bring to a lot of the situations in our life. Here's how it goes. Jeremiah 1, verse 4, please put it on the screen. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Okay, real quick, he is going to do this, but I want to make sure we do this beforehand. Again, he said he was concerned with mindset. That's what he's concerned about. Now, before we he goes through it, because I want to make sure when he gets to it, he can go through it a little bit at least before I interrupt him, but I want to work through it with you first so that I'm not... I'm not trying to combat his interpretation. We're just going at it with my interpretation, or I don't want to say the correct way, but there is a correct way to read Jeremiah. So we're going we're gonna to do this real quick. So now the, we've already talked about this a little bit, right? One through three, we've already set up the basis of who this, when this is happening, who's king, all of this. We've already set up the timeline. Now, this is the first thing outside of that timeline. Now, the word of the Lord came to me. We know this is Jeremiah. The Lord of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying this, right? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as the prophet to the nations. Some things are already being set up right here, right? So we are already set up. Uh, also, if you guys want to know what app this is, this is the, uh, the uh, ESV Bible Journal. Uh, you can get it for $30 online from the website or 15 if you have a Crossway um, account. So get a free Crossway account, get it for 15 So here we go. So here's this. Um, he sets it up right away automatically. Before I formed you, I knew you. So he's already set up. Before you were even formed, God was aware of Jeremiah. He knew what he was going to use Jeremiah for, which is a prophet to the nations. He was consecrated. He was appointed. And what was he consecrated and appointed for before he was even formed? He was going to be a prophet to the nations, right? Now, Jeremiah in verse 6 is clearly concerned about this because he says, I don't know how to speak. You want me to be a prophet, and I don't know how to speak. And he attributes this to the fact that he's very young, right? But the Lord said to Jeremiah, me, Jeremiah, do not say... I am only a youth, for uh, for to all of, wh of whom I send you, you shall go, and whoever I command you, you shall speak, right? So here's the thing. Don't be afraid about being young, because I'm going to send you, you're going to go. Where I command you, you're going to speak, right? He said, do not be afraid of them. So he already knows there's some fear built in Jeremiah. He knows that. Also, contextually, Jeremiah is fully aware of the sin of uh, the kingdom right now of Israel, and he probably knows that this ain't going to go well. And for whom, uh, for I am with you to deliver you. So there's a fear 
from Jeremiah about going to the people of the nations. And there's a fear that he's going to, he's probably going to die or get hurt. That's his fear. So the Lord has to tell him, don't be afraid about going. Where I send you, you'll go. What I tell you to say, you're going to say, don't be afraid of the people because I'm going to be the one that to deliver you anyway. So this is fully one through nine or one through eight rather is all about the Lord being in control and Jeremiah trusting him. Now, verse nine is where Furtick is going to end, is that the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And he said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth, right? So this above here, wherever you go, wherever you go, speak what I tell you, wherever I command you go, right? And then he gives him the word to speak. Now, this is where Furtick ended, but this is the rest of what God tells him. See that I have set you this day over the nations and over kingdoms. I pluck up and I break down. I destroy and I overthrow. I build and uh, to plant. So the idea is that there's a whole lot more to this of what's going on. God's totally in control. I have set you this day, right? So God's in control of what Jeremiah is about to have to do in the rest of the book of Jeremiah. This is not some one little text that's all by itself. This is part of a much larger narrative of what's happening, right? So all that being said, I'm going to let Furtick talk for quite a while here, but keep this in mind. Within the context of Jeremiah chapter one that we're looking at, we've established a timeline in verses one through three. We've established the conversation between Jeremiah and God, Jeremiah's concern and God's security to him that I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to be with you the whole time for the mission that you're going to read about Jeremiah being on for the rest of the book. The hard times, the hard words, the upcoming exile, the hard exile to Babylon, like the death and destruction that happens there. So that's the whole point, is that um, this is the context here is incredibly important. So I'm going to let him talk for a minute, and then uh, I'm going to read your comments while kind of he does that. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. And the Lord said to me, just do you. You don't know how to speak? Don't speak. No, that's cool. I, I, I thought I made you. But no, you, you do you. I thought I was the sovereign. God, who put you together. I thought I was the one who spoke you out of nothing before you were formed in your mother's womb. God doesn't tell Jeremiah upon his excuse, just do you. Look what he says, verse 7. Read it how it actually says. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. So this verse tells me, do you, do, let me show you on the screen. I think this is very powerful because here we are. I got the whole Bible on the screen, y'all. That guy on the plane would be so proud of me if he could see me today. Come on, some people are just watching this looking for Taylor at the Super Bowl, and I'm preaching the whole prophecy of God on a flip sideways TV screen. I'm going to do me. Hey. Hey. Y'all think she's going to make it back from Japan in time? I'm praying for Taylor. I like seeing her out there. I think she's great. Now, look at this. When we get to Jeremiah, Here we go. Jeremiah chapter 1, all the way to the verse. And I thought the little pin, yeah, where'd I put it? Back here. This is going to take a second for me to get used to this. At the, huh? At the top? It's by the book? The other book? I only got one book. Graham, come get it for me. Y'all give Graham a hand as he comes. Where'd it go? Oh, hey, it was hidden underneath the Word of God. No, no, you didn't hear me. It was hidden beneath the Word of God. 
That means that I thought it wasn't there, and it wasn't that it was gone, but it was hidden underneath the Word of God. I wonder what word God has spoken over you that is hiding something that you need in. Notice every illustration is about you somehow. This season. Now y'all give it up for Graham one more time. Come here. I love how the Lord corrected Jeremiah. It's very brilliant how God does it. The Lord said, "Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you." Do you takes on a little different significance when I am is with me. Stylus drop. Interesting takeaway. Now, why I really called him up here wasn't to help me with the stylus. We had an agreement before he came up here. That he would help me with this sermon. You may recognize Graham from such sermons as God's Got Your Back, part one, and uh, Don't Fight Your Future. Last time we were on the stage together, I let him get down on top of me and hold me down to represent all the things that hold us down in our life, and he enjoyed that. Today I'm gonna do a different illustration, turn the tables a little bit today, because what we talked about is, you know, this idea that you just do you, assuming that you've met you, factors out what God knows that you don't. And so I want to, I want to share with you something that, that he did when he was real little. I was telling them the story of… Okay, so really quick, just to get back to the, the point um, of even doing the sermon review, was to go over kind of what he marked on the board. Now, so far… <laughs> I'm, I, I want to make it very clear. I'm not saying that I'm 100% right here on this, though I think, I mean, this is how I would break it down and preach it for sure. But this idea of him going over, let me just change the color of this real quick. So we, yeah. So him just going, for example, and coming to like circling do and you and making that connection in some weird way is, I, I hope between showing kind of how we broke it down earlier versus how he did it at least illuminates that that's not like we're, we're, we're at best doing some really like corny wordplay just to tie it in with the book because that's, that's not clearly what's happening here with Jeremiah and God and the situation setting up. But we're going to go back, let him keep talking. Jacob and Esau, and I was telling them how Esau was grabbing Jacob's heel trying to get the birth or Jacob was grabbing Esau's heel rather trying to get the birthright and the blessing. Do y'all know this story? Okay, I'll tell you the whole story one time, but I can't tell you the whole thing right now. I was telling him about the part where Esau uh, was coming in from hunting and he was very hungry, and Jacob, his brother, was a good cook. And so Esau came in hungry from hunting, because apparently he wasn't a very good hunter because he didn't kill anything, or if he did kill something, he still wasn't cooked yet. So he's hungry, and Jacob's like, Hey, I got a bowl of beans, bring me the bowl. I got a bowl of beans that you can have. All you have to do is sell me your birthright. So they're bringing me a bowl right now. Y'all got it? Thank you, thank you. Let's give it up for the brother with the bowl. Yeah. So I brought this from home. Many ramen noodles have been cooked in this very bowl, if you only knew. One time we destroyed a microwave cooking ramen noodles in a bowl. I don't know how Elijah did that. But in exchange for a bowl of beans, Esau, who was the firstborn, sold his birthright to his brother and forfeited a blessing that God intended for him to have, all for a bowl of beans. My contention with a lot of us, not just young people, but a lot of us who have been Christians for a long time, is that we sell birthrights for bowls. Uh, 
Okay, so this is a good example of a good point, but what does this have to do with the actual text we're preaching from? Because he's right. I mean, there's lots of things we trade uh, that aren't worth anything. We trade worth things that are worth something for worthless things. We do do that. I mean, this would be a great illustration of sin, right? I mean, there's a constant, you know the glory of God and what you've been saved from and how good he is. So why would you ever enter into the, the, the sin that is the terribleness you know and came out of? And why would you enter back into that knowing the glory of God? But yet people do that often. And so like there's, there's, there is a connection that could be made here, not necessarily from this text at all. So I'm not sure what we're actually, where we're going, but the idea here, I mean, there, there, there is some value that could be drawn out of this about sin and, you know, the dog returns to his vomit and all those sorts of, those sorts of verses. I don't think we're going to go there though. Now we call it things that sound really good. You might've heard this called living your truth. I personally do not say that phrase, although I have nothing against the phrase. I just want to qualify it. Where do you get your truth from? Because if living your truth means repeating your experience, you are not a candidate for wisdom. Wisdom will always interrupt your experience to show you that what you always thought you were, you actually were not, but God had put, in a, put a seed inside of you that had not reached maturity yet in your life. And Esau, out of his immaturity, as a grown man, sold what he could have been for a bowl. Now, by the time you get into the New Testament, Paul calls it something different. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verse, I believe, about number 22. Give me that on the lower thirds, please. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. That doesn't mean don't go down memory lane. That doesn't mean don't be who you were uniquely created to be. That doesn't mean don't enjoy the things that make you uniquely you. Here's what it means. That part of you that is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And the problem with you being you is that sometimes what you think you want is in conflict with who you really are. See, this would be a really good this is this is the concern I I have basically with Ferdick is that there's a lot of opportunity here to actually get to the core of what causes this. I mean, we, we could take this and talk about sin and the power of sin and being shackled to sin and then the freedom you have in Christ and the freedom you have because of Jesus' life, death, resurrection to come out of that and put off the old man and put on the new self, right? There's, there's all sorts of verses that speak about that. But he constantly refers to it as the seed that's already in you. And so there's this default goodness that seems to be there that he he sort of talks about, you know, needing to be needing to sprout or be awakened or it's there. It just needs its little uh, little kickstart. And so we have all of this opportunity to actually talk about the old man being uh, to pursue pursuing those deceitful desires and going after sin and why that's so bad and where that actually ends and what the result of that is. And then because we've di dove into the, the the actual just depravity of what sin brings, we would then have the ability to talk about life in Christ, newness, right? We would have the ability to, to, to actually bring that up, freedom in Jesus. I don't know as if I've ever heard, except maybe a, a few really old sermons that I listened to of his when I was preparing that making of a minister, but I haven't heard anything recently in which he really dives into just being freed from sin and alive in Jesus in, in very clear ways. Um, again, this doesn't have anything to do with the text we're actually looking at, though. That's, I'm hoping we get back to the board. That's the whole point of even reviewing this sermon. You will find yourself in many different states throughout any given day. And I'm not calling you schizophrenic. I am saying by nature of the fact that you are a spirit that lives in a body, sometimes your body 
will try to get you to sell your birthright for a bowl. Help me preach, would you please? Graham heard the story about Jacob and Esau. I shared with him how Jacob, all of his life, was trying to get a blessing that wasn't his by pretending to be something that he was not. And he didn't have to because God wanted to bless Jacob. But I even shared the part where Jacob was, was blessing and he, and he grabbed his father's right hand and put it on his head because the right hand was the right hand of blessing. And he crossed his father's right hand and received the blessing that was reserved for the firstborn and stole it from Esau. And I told him that story. And that night I was praying with Graham and Elijah before they went to bed. And I felt Graham's hand grab my right hand and he put it on his head. And he said, Just call me Jacob, sucker. And he was five. And I started praying for him. And he's an amazing boy. And I see good things in his life. And I believe he has a birthright. And I coach my boys and I coach my daughter. And I have to coach myself and I coach you this way. That when you give up what you want most, for what you want now, you're not doing you. You're being deceived. And I can tell you're being deceived when people say stuff like, well, that's just how I am. I just go off. That's just how I am. I just say what I think. That is a bad strategy. Have you ever cataloged your thoughts? Not all of them. I, I'm not. I'm trying to let him go for a while without interrupting because, again, we have to be done by a certain time. So we're about halfway through the sermon and we're tracking pretty well. There's a couple things I want to say here, but I want to let him finish. Are FDA approved? <laughs> and I believe this message is important to a generation that is running around saying things like, live your truth. Because if he lives his truth, he's going to find himself in moments where it will feel true to him that this temptation is stronger than my faith, but it's not. There will be moments where it'll feel to him like popularity is more important than calling, but it's not. There will be moments where he will feel that something is true, but what if what you feel is true is actually a trap? Warn your neighbor real quick. Touch them and say, it's a trap. It's a trap. To act outside of the character that God has placed inside of you and call that you, it's a trap. See, this is the interesting language that he's using, because we could use much, much clearer biblical language here. And the reason the clarity would be important is because at this point it's, hey, no, your nature outside of Christ is going to pursue those things. Now, you can white-knuckle it for a while. You can white-knuckle it for decades. But eventually, if it's not Christ in you, Holy Spirit sanctifying you, your actual mind being renewed by the Spirit, right? If those things aren't happening and there's just the appearance of white-knuckle morality occurring because you think you're supposed to do it, that's only going to get you so far. And so the reality is that we, we, we see Paul talking about this all the time, is that, is that there's this perseverance of knowing. And we, we see this in Hebrews, right? We see, I think it's chapter 11, where it's like, hey, all these heroes of the faith pursued a, a promise they didn't get to see, but they did it because they had faith in what God was saying. They trusted in his word. And so that would be a perfect time to interject that text, that like, look, there's going to be times where you don't see it. You may never see it end here, but you're going to pursue it because why? You believe in the word of God. You trust God. And that takes you out of the equation. That takes this language of what God has planted in you out of the equation because it's all God anyway. I mean, we see that time and time again in scripture. Again, I'm just going to say this one more time. I'm a little frustrated because we've done nothing really with Jeremiah chapter one here other than than the wordplay of do you. That's really the only thing we've used Jeremiah for. Now, granted, we have a whole nother half hour for him to get to it. Um, but the real issue currently is just the verbiage, right? So here's the thing. One of the things that as, here, 
One of the things as believers we really have to be careful of is being able to distinguish between something that sounds good and something that is biblical. So there are going to be things that sound really good and very close to biblical. And then there are going to th be things that are very biblical. And so saying the seed in you, pursuing the thing God planted in you, is altogether different than saying persevering in Jesus. That's two different things. Because one of them puts all of the onus on God. God is the only one that's doing this versus if there's a seed in you, you're not nurturing it. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to, like, you're just, you're holding God back from growing this thing in you. It's all God anyway. So we, we have to be able to distinguish between the things that are kind of, um, kind of sound good and the things that do sound good. The enemy has some of you trapped and you don't know it. He has you trapped in the prison of what you call your personality. So now you run around saying things like, well, that's just the kind of person that I am. Well, if the kind of person that I am doesn't match the kind of God that he is. Also, I don't know what is wrong with this audio. Hold on real fast. We're going to see what's going on here. It's a trap to act outside of the character that God has placed inside of you and call that you. It's a trap. The enemy has some of you trapped and you don't know it. He has you trapped in the prison of what you call your personality. So now you run around saying things like, well, that's just the kind of person that I am. Well, if the kind of person that I am doesn't match the kind of God that he is, I've got to change some things and choose some things. Jeremiah, do you? God said, I. Steve Jobs has nothing on God. Steve Jobs made an iPad. God made, watch this, a resurrection. And the Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Touch your neighbor, say he's talking about you. Okay, so we did mention the resurrection. So there's that. That's good. We did mention that Jesus has been raised from the dead. That's good. And so one time, I remember being in high school. I don't know if I told you this story before. Maybe I told you it 10 times. And everybody was getting high, and I had never been high in my life. And I was that night planning to get high. And I remember feeling like, I'm sick of being a good kid. I'm sick of being alone on Saturday nights. I'm sick of this. I'm going to actually do it tonight. And I remember when I grabbed it, and I went to smoke it, and my friend slapped it out of my hand. And he looked at me and said, this isn't you. And I came, I came to Ballantyne, North Carolina today to tell you that's not you. Everything that's sabotaging you, I slap it out your hand and I declare that's not you. Every habit, that's not you. Look at your neighbor. Okay, but what makes it not you, right? So this is obviously a huge point. What makes this not you. It's Jesus. It's, it's, it's the old you has passed away, the new has come. And what brings that? Jesus. And to assume that they know that, not only within this enormous auditorium that he has, but also all of the satellite campuses that it's going out to, or all of the internet views that they're going to get. There are people that I know. Look, there are people that I know that watch Stephen Furtick. This is why I'm passionate about talking like this. I don't care if it's Stephen or somebody else. This is why I'm passionate about talking like this. Is there are people that I know that are living in sin, but will hear him say this and take on what he's saying and not have any issue with the fact that they're still living in sin. Because what they hear isn't that they need to repent, follow Jesus, and get in a local church. What they'll hear is, that's not you about certain things, and then not about others. And so when we talk about it's not you, why isn't it you? Well, it's because I've been changed by Jesus. I'm pursuing him, right? There, there's, there's a reason. There's a reason it's not you. Talk about the reason. Say, that's not you. Don't slap him. I don't want to start anything. 
But when I feel it rising up in me to take me down, I slap it. I demolish strongholds. The weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. Thus, this isn't you. Not the new you. But see, we're confused because we think that if it's automatic, that makes it authentic. I am not what I feel. I am not what I do. I am what God's word says I am, and he is the great I am. This changed my life. Okay. Hold hold on. Hold on really quick. I don't I don't think he just said what he said, but let's back this up real quick. Because we think that if it's automatic, that makes it authentic. I am not what I feel. That's true. Uh, but that's also a very therapeutic thing to say. I mean, therapists tell you that. I am not what I do. I. You're a little bit. Of what you do. Your actions are an extension of you. I mean, they are. I am what God's word says I am, and he is the great I am. This okay, so God's, I am what God's word says I am, and he is the great I am. So one of two things that he's saying here, and he may exa elaborate. So he's either saying that whatever God says I am is what I am because he, he created all things. Or he's saying that I am what God says I am, and he is the great I am. And therefore, I don't think he's saying, therefore, we are. That's what, that's what I was really confused about. I thought there for a second he was calling us all the great I am, which was going to be concerning. But I think all he's saying is whatever God says you are, you are because he created everything, which would be a great intro into without Jesus, you're a sinner apart from God and you need reconciliation because that's what the Bible says you are outside of Christ. And then if you're in Christ, then... You are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And so this would be a perfect place with 30 minutes left or so in the sermon to go down both of those paths and then preach Jesus. This changed my life because I wrote down the phrase, do you? And then I said, no, no. the new you. Jeremiah 1, 5, give it to me. The you that God says he knew. So maybe we should spell it different. Maybe... Doing the new you means doing the new you. Thank you, Jesus. How convenient that we have merchandise for this. You make all things new. Because, let's say I preach this to him and I'm like, okay, so don't just do what you want to do. Do what God tells you to do. So then you get out of the trap, right? Everybody say trap. Because I really think it's a trap to have an experience, form it into a belief, and then call it your truth. That's a trap. That's a trap. That's a trap. But then let's say you get out of the do you trap. Only to now bring my next illustration out. And this if the bowl took a while, so this this might really take a while. Bring it on out. And now you're about to find out why I brought Graham up for the illustration. Because let's say you get out of the, the do you trap. I'm just doing me. I'm just being me. That's just how I am. Then you get out of the trap, the do you trap, just do you, boo boo, do you, just do you. You get out of that trap. You're like, all right, I'm going to change. And now, that the devil sees you're out of the trap and you want to change and you want to get better and you're not happy with it exactly like it is, you get out of the do you trap and you get onto the future you treadmill. How many didn't know this was a treadmill? You thought it was a coat rack? That's all how you use it. And this is why I brought Graham on the stage. Now he's, now he's out of the trap. But now let's say that self-discipline and religion puts him on a treadmill 
where he starts looking at, okay, I'm going to do the new me. I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. My friend wakes up at 6 a.m. I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. I'm going to read five books of the Bible a day. Five alive. How many of y'all started with a real New Year's energy going into a new? See, and this, I'll just, I'll just say this. He's, he's a smart guy. Stephen Furtick is a smart guy, so surely he knows this. But I'll just say it. Um, he, he seems to be feeding the old, the, the very monster he's trying to kill here, right? So he's putting all the onus on you, and then telling you not to get in the, to get on the treadmill of religion and get trapped on the treadmill of religion. So don't do the you, don't do you, do the new you, but then you have to also avoid the next trap of the reli of religious trap. The way to avoid this, or at least mi uh, mitigate this, is to teach people to read the Bible as it is meant to be read. And so at this point, it's, you understand it's not a performance-driven thing, because it's not about anything I can do. It's all about what Jesus has done. And so now it's not about me repeating the same thing I used to do just in a different way, right? It's not me trying to do all the things for my accolades, and now I just try to do all the things for Jesus' accolades. It's that now I understand that I am not shackled to sin, but I am a slave to Christ, and therefore I am compelled, right? Paul says this in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter like 4 and 5, where he says we're, we're compelled by the realization that whether we're here and away from Christ or whether we're away from our body and with Christ, everything we're supposed to do is to, to please him. And therefore, if we are here trapped in our body, he says, then we are ministers of reconciliation to go forth as ambassadors to Christ. And so it's not a, oh no, we have to do this. It's a really heavy duty. It's a, I want to do this because I love Jesus. And so you know it's not about performance-based mentality of the treadmill of religion. It's about doing things because... We're compelled to do them out of love for Christ. And so if we preach the reality of being shackled to sin, being freed from sin because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and now into new life, a new life that isn't built on the same foundation of performance, 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 do, 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 do. But now it's based on the reality that I am free in Jesus, and that freedom and love compels me as a servant of Christ to go do things for him as an ambassador of the kingdom, right? If we just preach that, we don't have to try to mitigate just the, the doing you in a new way in doing religion. Just preach the, <laughs> preach the gospel, and it takes care of itself. 24, and we realize we just take it a day at a time. I think the crazy thing is, and I would do this illustration myself, but I'm wearing these boots. They're new. I can't crease these. These are my new book boots. I'm not messing these up. They're heavy. And I'm not called to the cardio ministry anyway. I've told y'all that before. So now, here we go. Do the new you and go. And so now, the devil's got some of us out there not settling, but striving. Because to do you, just do you and not let God have his say, and to commit and put yourself in concrete for what you've been up to this point is a trap. I know it looks like a bowl is a trap. And I know this looks like walking, but he's not going anywhere. To just do you is to live your life cheated. Everybody say cheated. But to get this idea in your mind that there is a future you that God would love more, or there is a future you that God could use. This is a repackaged book, or at least a repackaged concept, because this, this thing that he just said is from one of the first three books he ever wrote, which is the God will love the later version of you. Like he goes into that concept, how that's not true. It's actually not too bad of a book. I forget which one of the, the title it is. Some of his first books were not too bad, really. Um, but this is the same concept he brought up in one of those first books. Or that there is a future you that would be worthy of love in a relationship. Or there is a future you that could feel good about yourself and your life, and it's just one accomplishment away. 
is to get out of the trap and onto the treadmill. And it's good as long as it's good. And it works as long as it works. And I wonder, are there some people here who have been cheated because you've settled for what you thought you were? But I also wonder, are there some people here who are chasing? Chasing something that you think you need to be because you saw somebody else be it. See, I mean, there's so many times where we could point to Jesus here. <laughs> I mean, there's so, so many times that we could point to Christ, and we've missed every single one of them, and that's just frustrating. Chasing something that you scrolled past and thought it was the full story of what a happy family looked like. Chasing after future you. So it goes like this, like, yeah, boy. You're going to be great one day. All you got to do is get through high school, and then you go to college. Now all you got to do is get this degree. Now all you got to do is find somebody who's actually hiring with that expensive degree that you're going to be paying off for the next 50 years. Come on. And so now I'm chasing, and I'm coughing, and I'm running, and I'm so glad I had kids so they could do this part of my illustrations now that my beard needs to be dyed. Come on. And so now I'm chasing, and it's great, but not only is it getting faster and faster and harder, but I look around and I realize I don't think I'm ever going to be anything but me. And here I am thinking that somehow this collage, watch, because here's what we do we get a collage, right? And then we get the person with all the money. We get the person. And see, here's, here's where illustrations fall short. It is now, you can hear, I mean, I'm assuming you can hear the audience. They are now more concentrated on the, the amusement of his son running on this treadmill and having trouble keeping up than actually listening to what he's saying. I mean, not that it's world shattering information, but that's what's happened. The, the illustration has now overtaken the point. And that's what, as a pastor, you don't want to happen. Unless, I mean, unless your goal is humor here your illustration is now overtaking your actual ultimate point that you want people to know. Person with all the girls, we get the person with all the success, with all the followers. Oh, if I had a thousand followers, now you need 10,000. Beep, just went up. Beep, just went up. Here comes the incline. Now we got social media. I didn't even have Twitter when I was a teenager, and it's not even called Twitter anymore, and my beard is gray, and I'm still chasing, going, well, maybe if I turn 50, I'll have wisdom, and maybe if I get through this, I'll be happy, and I'm going to rest when, and I'm going to feel good about myself when, and before before you know it. No, I'm going up. 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 You're holding on. But the Bible says, give me Jeremiah 1 5. The word of the Lord came to me and said, Before you were formed, I knew you. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord is coming to you right now. Out of the trap, off of the treadmill, and into the truth until the truth gets into you and you recognize I've been running after something that's already mine. I've just been living beneath its potential. I'm already clean by his blood. I'm already saved by his grace. I'm already redeemed by his liberty. Okay, so he's assuming, I just want to, he is assuming that he is exclusively talking to people that already believe in Jesus, but have a wrong understanding of Jesus. Like that's, that's the very specific individual that he's speaking to is the one that has misunderstood and, and, and likely misapplied the gospel. So they've turned the gospel into a works-based type of salvation for themselves. And he's in this very specific individual that he's talking to is he's reminding them that you already have it. You don't have to work for it which is f fine and good. It has nothing to do with Jeremiah. 
Um, there's other verses that, that, that say this, but then he's also not calling people out of sin into repentance because those people, it isn't already theirs, right? And he's not confronting really people that are c confident that their, their works do save them. And so there's a lot of peripheral things here that we're missing, uh, while he's assuming that all of the millions of people that will see this fit into that category. I'm already to the praise of his glorious grace. Why? Because I refuse to live cheated and I refuse to live chasing because I'm chosen. Chosen. Say it. Get that word in your mouth. Chosen. 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 I love you, Holly, but I didn't pick you for that illustration. I didn't pick you for that illustration because I didn't know if you could last long enough on 12 for me to get the scripture up. And I'm not picking on you. You do a lot of amazing things. I didn't pick you for it. I picked somebody. I chose him because I knew that if he had to, he could beat me up. He's in wrestling shape. I'm telling you, God chose you. I'm telling you, God chose you. And I'm saying he knew you. See, I want you to see the difference. Close your eyes. Okay, so what he's doing is, is very much centering on Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, verse 5a, right? The first half of the... And then he's pulling that out of the context of what is actually happening in Jeremiah 1 and then just shoving that <laughs> down your throat. Now, does God know you? Yes, he does, right? Does he know everything that's going to happen in your life? Yes, he does. Is that the point of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5? No, it's not. Right? There's, there's, there's some things theologically we can pick up from verses as we go along. There's application that can be had from reading Scripture. But there's so much more happening in Jeremiah chapter 1 than what he's making it out. I mean, the entire this is about God knowing his people, seeking his people, having a standard for his people. And then when they fail time and time again to uphold the standard he has set for them, there is right and just punishment merciful and gracious punishment that comes to them to draw them back to him but it doesn't it doesn't feel kind and it doesn't feel good when it happens but this is the exile that he's warning them about this is the exile they're going to be taken into and Jeremiah chapter 1 tells us of the prophet he chooses to do that with and it gives us some background on him that he is worried that the people are not going to want to hear him. And he's right. They're not going to want to hear him. And he is right to fear for his life because they have killed prophets that have come before him. So he's right to have that fear. But God gives him a word specifically for him that where I send you, you're going to go. The words I'm going to give you, you're going to speak. And you don't need to fear those people because I will deliver you. And this is exactly what we read in Jeremiah chapter 1. And so this peripheral one verse reading to make it all about you really, really, really ne neglects what is happening in Jeremiah chapter one. You know, how you've been chasing after something that you think when you get it, when you get there, I'm going to do the new me, new year, new me, no new year, same nose. Yeah. But what if you've been running after something that is already yours? Perhaps, perhaps, the addiction is something that the enemy planted in your life because there is something so amazing inside of you that he wants your birthright and you gave it away for a bowl. Perhaps God… This, this is still making it all about you. There's something so amazing in you. What we see over and over again, I, f I forget the text where it's at, but um, something along the lines of at the end of time when, when 
God will look at us and tell us, I saved you for my glory. So even my salvation is for his glory. It's not even, it's not even for me. It's not about, it's just, he saves me so he can say, look how merciful I am. Really is. Now I'm going to minister this because this is me. This is me right here. Watch this. Because I sit there and go, well, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who goes for it. I'm somebody who doesn't settle. I'm somebody who really demands the best out of myself. I'm somebody who wants to improve. That's fine. It's called self-righteousness. Because when I talk like that and I don't receive by grace, I end up like grandma almost was. He's still breathing heavy up here. Don't let him fool you with his closed mouth. I hear him breathing. Running after something that how long can I keep this up? And I'm chasing, but I'm chosen. You don't have to chase it when you're chosen. You can walk in it. And I mean, really walk, not on a treadmill of. Boy, God, you can walk with God, walk through your day, walk through your life. Your Father will speak to you. Your Father will slap stuff out of your hands. Your Father will look at you going so hard because, oh, when I wrote this book, I thought, I don't want people to just see the title and go, another one of those. Do the new me. What's so wrong with the old me? No, no, no. You're just not going back far enough. God told Jeremiah, I'm going to call you to do a new thing. How many sense God is calling you to stretch your faith in new and unique ways that are nuanced to you and this message? Just put in the chat. He did not tell Jeremiah he was going to do a new thing. He actually said he set him apart. He consecrated him before he was even born for this particular task, which not everyone, not everyone is consecrated for this particular task. Look, look. There are some people that are going to have like enormous impacts on society. The reality is the majority of Christians throughout time, they just live their life faithfully in Christ, right? No books will ever be written about them. No movies will ever be made. You will never know their name. But what did they do? They just faithfully lived their life. They raised their families. They loved their kids. They loved their spouses. They went to work every day. They were faithful in their job. And yeah, they probably had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, a lot of hard times, but they, pers they, they persisted in Jesus, holding fast to the truth that they are his and he is theirs. And so through the ups and the downs and the hard times and the great times and everything in between, they held faith in Christ. And then they died and they were buried and you've never heard of them. I mean, maybe you just need to hear that that might be you. And you need, like, that's fine. God has, according to Paul at Mars Hill, has placed us in various places for a purpose. And some of us, right, most of us need to realize that very well may be the job that you hate to be a witness over decades of God's goodness and faithfulness and trustworthiness. Do the thing you're called to do, guys. This whole the new you, you, there's this greatness in you. Yeah, maybe. And maybe that greatness looks like going to work, being faithful, loving your kids, loving your spouse until the day you die. Maybe that's what it looks like. And we should be fine with that. That's not the message that's coming across here. A new thing, a new thing. All right. But, but see, but see, God says, before I called you to do the new thing, before you were born, I knew you, which takes the pressure off of me because it lets me know that God is very, very comfortable with my process and that he is partnering with me in the process. And I am not chasing after a God who might love me when I kick this habit. And I am not chasing after an achievement that might make me feel like my life is worthy. And I am not, listen to me, everybody who's not married right now, I am not chasing another person thinking they will make me whole and fulfilled. I am not chasing an opportunity to collaborate in my business thinking that that will somehow then set me free. I'm already free. 
and I'm choosing. I'm choosing to walk away from the bull. I'm, I'm choosing because God hmm, chose you. I believe God chose me to do this. I struggle with it. I doubt it sometimes. Y'all, I was reading Jeremiah last night for our Bible club. Shout out Elijah and Kelsey. We're there in Lynchburg watching right now. And uh, we're in Jeremiah right now over about the 14th, 15th chapter. By the way, if you read Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 6 is about the high point. It gets really dark for them. See, what's really curious, at least he brings this up, right? At least he does acknowledge that there's a whole lot more in Jeremiah. The next 10 chapters. Isn't that crazy? God was calling him to do something hard. He said, I know it's going to be hard. I know you're going to get up to speak sometimes. And we're not all called to speak, but watch this. We're all chosen. You need proof? Ephesians 1 4. Put it on the screen. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Whoa! He told Jeremiah, You were chosen before you were born. Paul takes it further. He said, You were chosen before the world was born. Before God made what I see, He had a plan for me. Go to verse 11. They don't believe me yet. It takes a lot of scripture to convince these people. They're kind of stubborn, Graham. In Him, we also were chosen. That's fine for Jeremiah. I'm not called to speak. In Him, in Jesus, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of His will. I'm worried that some of you are walking and running on a treadmill after things that aren't even in God's will for you. That's not a bad point, right? That's a pretty good point. There are things you will chase. Now, there's no way to know, right, <laughs> until, until the middle of it. And nor is he going to talk about those that may not be chosen. We're not going to touch that. <laughs> that would be too messy. Wow. So say, I'm chosen. God chose you. Now comes the question, will you? Which you will you choose? Because I have to decide this every day I wake up in my life. Am I going to choose the me that I've seen so far? Or am I going to be open to the surprise of the Holy Spirit of God? You could probably sit down now. Didn't he do a great job? I don't want to make him stay all day. Come on, he did a great job. A 16-year-old helping his dad preach. I was 16 when I really got serious about my faith that my mom raised me and made my commitment to Christ. 16 years old. So when I look at him, I think about that. It makes me want to cry all the things God could do through him. But, but don't ever chase what they say you can be. If we did... All right, I'm just checking the time real quick. We got about 15 minutes left. Oh, I hope we can finish this. Uh... I probably going. wouldn't be standing here today. Because when I was 16, Chris Dixon invited me to join the Voices of Unity Choir at Berkeley High School, where his mom, Martha Dixon, was the director. And his cousin, Arturo, was the lead soprano. And Arturo was a boy, had the highest voice of any boy that I've ever heard in my life. But here's the interesting thing about being invited to join the Voices of Unity Choir is that when I went to join the Voices of Unity Choir. Y'all might remember the old show that said one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. The only white guy in the Voices of Unity Choir was me. And I turned to Chris and said, you sure you want me in the choir? Because I noticed when everybody would start to rock one way, I would naturally rock the wrong way. And I'm like, are you sure? But I loved it, but I wanted to do it. But a few of my white friends were like, hey, what are you doing over there with them? See, this is the problem with living your truth. Racists think they're right. And the people were telling me you don't belong in the choir thought they were right. The white people, the black people were glad to have me in the choir. They actually simplified the march into the spring concert so that I could be a part. They were very happy to have me. Now, when they asked me, 
How do you have a multicultural church? I'm glad Chris said, we want you. We want you to sing with us. Come sing with us. No, not the one in the three, the two in the four. Come clap with us. And if you would ever get with God and get in agreement with God. I, I was really hoping he was going to say you could have a multicultural church because of Jesus. Right? Jesus breaks down cultural boundaries. Jesus is the one that breaks down the, uh, in every aspect, the, the sins that divide us from him. He is a reconciler. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, or 1 Corinthians, uh, no, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He reconciles us and calls us ministers of reconciliation, right? Not just with him, but with others. And so there, there's, a, there's another gospel message to have there. Not just come sing with us. But, but Jesus breaks down those walls. Could have been a good time to bring that up. And stop listening to what everybody else thinks can be. You might find out that God put something in you that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, that has not entered into the heart of a man. I wonder what's in you, 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 you. And the white people mess up the clap. We couldn't even keep it going five seconds. But I love what's in you, you. you. It's not, not this one, not what has Jesus done for you? What has Jesus brought you out of? What is the gospel about? We're, we are assuming so much about the people's understanding of the gospel. I can tell you right now, I have been in ministry for going on 19, almost 20 years. And I can tell you with my interactions with a multitude of people in a multitude of churches, very few people could communicate the gospel to you in a way that is correctly in line with the scriptures. Like that's all, like, let's just focus on that. If you don't want people trapped by lies or trapped on a treadmill or to have a misunderstanding of how you are to live your life, preach the gospel, make it clear, have them understand it, and then they will be confronted, right? They will have to confront the lies of all types of sin if they understand that the gospel is Jesus' death, life, or life, death, resurrection, and that you, as a believer, are to be changed by that. If you follow him, the old is gone, the new has come. Which means your views on race change based on the scripture. Your views on sexuality change based on the scripture. Your views on relationships and money and all sorts of things change based on what the scripture says you're supposed to do. Preach that. Not, not a new version of you, not a thing God's already planted in you. The change that is brought by the reality of Christ and Christ crucified and his resurrection. Love how this church is filled with uniqueness. And some of us praise loud and some of us praise quiet. And some of us pray in tongues and some of us pray in a journal and some of us sing fast songs and some of us worship the Lord to cantatas and some of us are fluent in the scriptures and some of us are new to the scriptures but I know one thing about this church you are a chosen people you are a royal priesthood you are a holy nation a people belonging to God to declare the praises Come on, to declare the praises. Let's take 10 seconds and declare the praises. My God is awesome. He rules in power. He makes the seas fall. He makes the waves roll. He makes the breakers dash. He makes the storm cease. He maketh my enemies like a footstool. He makes me lie down. In green pastures. He has freed me from sin. Oh, we didn't mention that. <laughs> Such were some of us. Oh, we're not going to talk about that. Okay. Woo! Look at 
at you acting crazy. I thought I knew you. Maybe there's more in you than you knew. So now we got work to do. We got to do Jeremiah 1, chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 9. Put it on the screen because after Jeremiah got done doing his excuses, and I'm going to give you a preview of next week's message. You better be back here next week because I'm not even into it yet. I'm not even into it. You are shouting over the syllabus right now. Imagine what the class is going to be when we really get into this and get your mind set on things above. Y'all remember how I was up here with the guitar two weeks ago talking about tuning to truth? That's what I want to apologize. I made a mistake. I was really hoping that he was going to use that board more. <laughs> that was the whole. That was the whole purpose of even doing this review. I guess I should have watched it before. What we're going to do, we're going to get practical. I took six mindsets. I didn't even realize God was setting this up, but he knew. And there are six strings on an acoustic guitar, and there are six mindsets that I will be sharing with you over the next six weeks. And I'm going to give them to you, and I'm going to preach them to you, and next week I'm going to talk to you about how to agree with God, how to agree with him about who he says you are, how to agree with him about what he says is still possible for you at this point in your life, how to agree with God about his priorities, how to agree with God about his values. and Stop agreeing with your limitations and stop arguing for your past. And to do it, we got to get these six mindsets not only in your heart, but watch this, verse 9. The Lord said, I am putting my words in your mouth. I sat down last year as I was teaching Do the New You beta version to the church, and I realized God was doing something. And I'm closing, so y'all don't have to sit down. And if you stand, it'll make me close quicker, so you decide. And everybody stood. Because I began to write, What are the things that God says are true? And I was basing it, Yeah, stand up, stand up. That's enough for one week. But over the next six, I want to take these six sayings. Jeremiah 1 4 again, please. The word of the Lord came to me saying, What are you saying? Better question Are you saying what God sees when you look in the mirror or what you see? This is self help, guys self-help. I mean, it's, it's a spiritualized, Christianized self-help, but it still is. What I want to walk you through in this message as we gather together as an online community, I mean, we got resources, but I want to give you the six declarations to make over your life so that not only do we get your mind right, but we get your mouth right. This, this is, the declarations thing is very much… Um, a Joe Olstein esque thing. Bethel, Bethel does like this speaking over your finances thing. Yeah. So that you begin to say what God sees until you see it too. This is very close to manifestation, by the way. Definitionally, I'm not saying that's what he's talking about, but it's very definitionally close to manifestation, which is a new age practice. The new you. I'm bursting to share this with you. Do you feel like I'm? about to blow up and be on little pieces all over the fourth row of the church. I am, because this is in me, because I need this, because I hold bowls sometimes, and I'm cheated, cheated out of what I could be, cheated out of what I could see, cheated of the example I could set, cheated of the freedom I could experience, cheated of the chain that could break. But then I put that bowl down, and boy, and then I start <sighs> chasing until I fall out and realize that it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. Did you know Paul said that? By the grace of God, I am what I am. The reason he says this, I believe, I could be wrong, you'd have to double check me on this, but I'm almost positive the reason he says, by the grace I am, God, I am what I am, is because it is all Jesus that changed me. Paul's point is, I would not be where I am doing what I'm doing if not for the grace of God. And what did God do for Paul? He utterly changed him. 
Road to Damascus. Total change. From a murderer to a preacher. Night and day different. The old man is gone. The new has come. Why? Because of Jesus. His life, death, resurrection. So I'm choosing to live chosen. God chose you. Will you? Will you? Will you choose you even though you know you? I'll be honest, if I was picking somebody to make a difference in the world, I probably wouldn't pick me, but God did. I wonder what he knows about my brokenness that he can use to bring a balm. And I'm looking at lives today that look like iPads, brand new out the box, and I'm wondering what, what could it be if it got in the right hands. Uh. The six mindsets go like this. And shout out to my man Dave Ulrich, who got an early copy of the book, and he put them on his mirror and he sent me a picture and said, This book is going to change lives, Pastor. <laughs> Your book. Your book is going to change lives. I mean, we could just read the Bible, and we could learn how to do that, um, and we could let Jesus transform us, but your book is going to change lives. I'm not saying whoever this dude is is saying Stephen Furtick's book is better than the Bible. I'm just saying I can guarantee you the Bible's better. I'll guarantee you. Let's go. Put that picture up that Dave sent me. He wrote each of them out on a Post-it note. He didn't even know. We have a stack of post-it notes for all of you today with these six mindsets on them. You're going to get it if you're here. If you're online, you better write them down right now and make your own post-it note. Repeat after me. Mindset one, I'm not stuck unless I stop. We're going to talk about that next week, what's blocked you from becoming, what's blocked you from believing. We're going to talk about that from the Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit will minister it to you. The second one says, Oh, you've heard this if you've been around my church for a while. Christ is in me. I am enough. I thought that was a typo. I thought it was Christ in me. He is enough. Oh, apparently not. Apparently he, I am enough. No, you're not. He is. He is enough. Christ is enough. You're not, but he is. I hope you're repeating these in the comments right now. I want you to say it out loud. I want you to type it. I want you to write it. I want you to receive it. Christ is you in me. say it. I am enough. Here's one you've heard before. With God, come on, with God, there's always a way. That's true. And by faith, I will find it. You may not see yeah, it. Maybe you yeah, will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to find it. You're going to find it. You think there is no way. You just haven't seen it yet. The word of the Lord is coming to you. Uh, I don't know. We're going to cut it close. I've got to get off here soon. This is what I tell myself before I preach to you, number four. God is not against me, but he's in it with me, working through me, fighting for me. We might write a song about that. Already did. Number five, say, my joy is my job. You might not like that week. You might want to skip that week. Put the responsibility on you next week, that week. And then this is really really important to believe that God has given me everything I need for the season I'm in. Now, if we get you tuned to this, this truth… See, and this is the problem I have, and I've said this before. I said this with the Catherine Crick interview, or not interview, the Catherine Crick sermon review. Whenever somebody gets up to preach their book, that is one of the biggest red flags because now it's look at my book. I could care less. Let me, I could care less if every one of those sayings is connected to a scripture verse. Just preach the scripture. Within Christian culture, we have this really odd thing that if somebody obtains some sort of platform and they have so many followers, then we assume that they are worth listening to. We should check everybody on everything, me included. Like, check everything I say against the Word of God. And if I come up short, message me, DM me, email me. I want to know. But no one's checking verdict on this. 
at least not a lot of people, and those that are, are getting called uh, jealous or hypocritical or religious. You will never be the same. I want to pray for you right now. The word of the Lord came to you today, didn't it? Came to me too. Saying, before I formed you, I knew you. I feel like we need to connect. Would you just either grab the hand or put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you? First of all, Lord, we thank you that we're not chasing your love, acceptance, or grace. It has been given to us by your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that this is the last day that we will believe the deceitful desires. We may still struggle with them, but from this day forward, we are oriented toward truth. Your truth will make us free. And God, today we thank you that we are chosen by you. And now we chose, we chose to put ourselves in the path of your power today. Because we did, you spoke a word, and this word is now received in our hearts. I declare rain for the seed that was sowed today, for the words that were spoken. I decree and declare an increase of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I thank you that our eyes have not seen, nor have our ears heard, nor has it entered into the heart of a man what you have prepared for those who love you, but you have revealed it by your Spirit. I thank you for revelation, and I thank you for grace to change, and I thank you that you are making all things new. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you clap your hands at every location? Uh. 30 seconds. Let's go. Came up. Okay. Oh, let's review really quick because I got to get off here. Um, so did he read the scripture? He technically read it. Yes, he did. He did read verses uh, 3 through 9, I think is what he read in Jeremiah chapter 1. Did not exegete the text at all, um, though we know that he knows what the rest of Jeremiah said because they're reading through it apparently in their in their Bible study time, I guess, but didn't read that at all. Uh, or he read it, acknowledges that it's there, and then ignores it when he's actually preaching on the text. And did he preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. No, he did not. Which is disappointing because there were a number of times in which you could have preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, called people to repentance, uh, corrected false teaching, encouraged believers, and uh, brought and 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 uh, brought people into the teaching of righteousness. You could have done all of those things, all the things that Paul says is what the scripture is for when he talks to Timothy. You could have done all those things. We've done not, none of those things. Um, so this will make some of you happy. This is the absolute, uh, unless something completely changes, <laughs> I, this is the last Stephen Furtick sermon I'm going to do for a while because it's just, it's, it's blatantly clear at this point that the man is going to take scripture and do whatever he wants with it and use it for his own, uh, his own book sales apparently is what he's going to do. So there's that there, there is, there was no, I mean, if you, if you were to cut out well, you wouldn't even have to cut it out. I think he mentioned Jesus maybe a handful of times, and that was in passing. If you cut all of those out and just leave the God parts in and take the scripture out, it's a motivational speaking session. There's plenty of motivational speakers that use Jesus, or not Jesus, but God as a sort of platform, um, and they sound exactly like Stephen. So, <sighs> this is disappointing. <laughs> this is just... So frustrating. I thought he was going to use the board more, which is the whole reason I did this. And then it's just frustrating that he gets to the end and it, it is what it is. When you have opportunity after opportunity to preach the gospel and you just don't. If you found this helpful, <laughs> if you found this valuable, please leave a like. Um, that helps it get it out to the algorithm. Thank you for all of you guys. If you stayed around for this entire uh, two hours, you deserve a gold star. 
Um, wow, that's amazing. You you took a Friday afternoon to do that. Hopefully you found it helpful. And if you're re-watching this and you found it helpful as well, make sure you share it, like it. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and do that. And if you haven't watched it yet, watch The Making of a Minister by Stephen Furtick. It will give you a little bit more of a clue on his background. I don't cover any of his theology, uh, but it does tell you how he got to where he got to now. And I found that incredibly interesting. So, <sighs> wow. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. I'll talk to you later. Bye.